Hello everyone, and welcome to my Unit 5 AP Human Geography review video. My name is Arjun Karnam, and let's see if I can get this done within 15 minutes. So, let's just get started. So, Unit 5 is on agriculture, and let's just dive right in. Agric agriculture is basically the science or the practice of farming and the cultivation of plants and uh, animals and using them to benefit us as humans. And so, you may be thinking, why should we raise plants? Why don't we just use, why don't we just go back to the olden days and start hunting animals and on, on the spots and, and gather them? Well, you see, plants provide us a stable source of food. Well, you may be thinking, they're not that stable. What if there's like a monsoon or something? Well, in comparison to hunting and gathering, they're actually quite stable. You, you're not in the fear every single day of, well, am I going to find a, I don't know, a deer today? At least you'll know that, okay, at least I'll have 10 bushels of corn grown even at the worst, in the worst case scenario. So it provides you a stable uh, source of food. Ra plants can raise a lot more of people, a lot more people. You have to think that, all right, say I have 10 pigs. Sure, you might live off those 10 pigs for a few days, or a few days, for a few weeks, but it's not gonna last you long. And so, since we have a stable for source of food and now we have the ability to support large populations, humans were able to do things like settle down in a place, and then this led to uh, the creation of civilizations. And so over here, I have a fancy little chart, and basically it's in log 10, and it shows you the amount of uh, people per square, square mile that a specific agricultural method, per se, and uh, will last you. And so here we have, whoops, here we have hunting and gathering, which is at the very bottom, and so, it will support, in an area, about one person per square mile. And so, as you can see, you don't support very many people, but you take up a lot of land. So, while this may have been the way our ancestors hunted, in today's uh, time of day, with 7 billion people in the world, hunting and gathering is, it will not cut it. And so, then you have herding, which is slightly more efficient, because you're living off of animal products instead of animals themselves but even this is not terribly efficient and then we go to uh, shifting cultivation which is slash and burn ag agriculture we go to traditional farming which is uh, stationary farming and then we go to modern farming with its fertilizer and crop rotations and stuff and so let me get my pen here we can also see that this is kind of the way that farming developed over time as well. We see hunting and gathering the first being the first thing, and then you see herding and uh, shifting farming kind of developing alongside each other. This is really bad, but I mean you get the idea. So you see, hunting and gathering leads to herding and shifting farming, shifting agriculture, and then which then leads into traditional farming. Uh, which then leads into modern farming. So, let's keep moving. So, who had the brilliant idea to start farming? Who thought that, okay, let, let's put this thing in the ground and see what happens. Uh, what Carl, it's obviously not a single person, it's a group of people. And so, uh, here's Carl Saar and his theory, which is paramount to understanding how agriculture started off and how it's gotten to where it is today. So, he says that we start off with vegetative planting, which is basically cutting the roots of a plant and then planting that. So, basically cutting off cutting off the root and then putting that in the ground and letting that grow. So, uh, it's, he says it started in Southeast Asia, and there was also independent places where it started within the Andes Mountains and West Africa. Obviously, these people didn't know each other because they're kind of separated by large amounts of land and an ocean. And so, uh, Carl Sauer suggests that it started in Southeast Asia and these independent arts because there's a lot more plant diversity there and a lot more root-based crops. Because you have to think, Southeast Asia is a highly tropical area, so it just makes sense that there's going to be a, a large diversity in the rainforest and a lot of them are going to be root-based. 
and eventually diffused, diffused e eastward to China, Japan, and westward to Southwest Asia. And then Carl Sauer thought, uh, after vegetative planting, people came up with the idea of seed planting, which is basically planting the seeds, which is what we do now. And so, you have to think, seed planting is going to be a lot more efficient than uh, vegetative planting because uh, it's going to be higher yield because a single plant is going to field, in terms of like corn, hundreds of seeds while only maybe like two or three roots. So you've already increased the potential yield by uh, tens and hundreds. And so it hard, had hearts in uh, Southwest Asia and an independent heart in Ethiopia. And the Southwest Asia hearth diffused to Europe, the Indus Valley, and East Asia, like China uh, and Korea. And Ethiopia is said to just have stayed there, like, didn't go anywhere. So, now, since we're talking about agricultural history, you can't avoid revolutions when you're talking about agriculture. I mean, again, talking about history. And so, let's move on to the four agric agricultural revolutions and how they have shaped and brought us the agriculture we know and love today. So, we have Agricultural Revolutions 1 and 2. Uh, revolution 1 is also called the Neolithic Revolution, and it occurred uh, a while ago, a little bit ago, 12,000 years ago. And so, the main revolution part, the main part that was changing, was that we are shifting now from hunting and gathering to domesticating plants and animals. And at this point, people start settling down, they start, as we said, taking those roots and putting them into the ground, seeing what's going to happen, and we start domesticating animals for our own uses. And then we go into Revolution 2, and it's the most, more recent one, uh, it's uh, around 200 years ago, it was, it coincided with the agricultural, uh, industrial revolution, and uh, one important thing to note is the enclosure movement and Britain thought that everybody owning a little bit of land was inefficient. So, inefficient. So, let the rich people buy the land. And this kind of ties in to the Industrial Revolution. Because if you think back, in Industrial Revolution, you had, in, during it, you had factories popping up. And so, basically, you had all these, uh, kind of low-level, poor farmers being, selling their land and going to the urban areas. And what does a factory need? It needs cheap labor, and so what you had is you had these farmers uh, getting jobs within the factories, which kind of fueled the social aspect of the industrial revolution. And so, with the re uh, the second agricultural revolution, you f you get a bunch of new farming techs uh, technologies. Uh, you get irrigation, fertilizers, you get crop rotation, field rotation rotation is new, but crop rotation, and so basically you have agriculture is being improved improved uh, greatly, and so those were those two revolutions. Next we have the bio and the green revolutions. The green revolution was took place during the 1950s, and it was pioneered by a name, man named Norman Borlaug, and so the revolution part of this was it had hybrid, hybrid seeds and advanced fertilizers and it greatly helped uh, locations such as Mexico and India but Africa it didn't quite help as much and this didn't go without its flaws the well the green revolution did help feed millions of people in Mexico and India it also brought upon brought upon the problems of uh, increased pollution because fertilizers uh, going into the drift into these streams will cause pollution. You had the same uh, problem with the pesticides uh, going into runoff. You had a bunch of water strain because you had a bunch of plants being grown in areas where not much had been grown. And so you have water strain, land strain. Uh, there was a c complaints about there not being enough diversity in the plants. And so you had the problem of monocultures emerging which means that everything in a large area is every single crop is very similar and so that means if a, a blight a like a plant disease came in it would easily be able to wipe out everything in one fell swoop 
and so that those those were some of the shortcomings of the Green Revolution, but it did help a tremendous amount of people. Next, we have the Bio Revolution, and so the revolution aspect of this was that we used genetic engineering to make plants and animals better. Whether or not you think that's ethically right is up to you. It's an ongoing debate about uh, GMOs and whether or not they're right. And so, if you're interested in that, uh, look it up. It's very interesting. And so, basically, uh, you had the push to make uh, plants faster. They'd uh, grow and reproduce faster. They would get uh, larger. They'd be able to uh, withstand pesticides. And so, an example of this would be uh, the largest GMO company is a company called uh, Monsanto. They're a whole other mess. But anyway, you have uh, Monsanto, and it creates these Roundup Ready plants, which are basically plants that have been genetically modified so that they can withstand Monsanto's fertilizer and pesticides, which is called Roundup. And so uh, that's what that's for. And some other things is drought resistance and the ability to fly. Well, the last one's obviously a joke, but you, you can see that uh, we're trying to get plants to be able to do things they haven't been able to do before. And so this leads into the whole debate. Uh, I'll just lift off some supporting criticisms about this. Some supports is that it increases output. It makes things cheaper since you'll have more uh, crops. And um, it would be it would be more food for our growing world. Our, gro our world is rapidly growing. And we need, and the argument is that we need to be able to uh, co keep up with this. And the only way to do that is genetically modified organisms. And some criticisms are, are that you lack gen genetic diversity you run into this problem where it's called superbugs and superweeds where if you put strong pesticides on plants and then in the hopes to wipe out the weeds and stuff eventually nature's going to take its course and then the weeds will be able will develop and adapt and be able to withstand the pesticides so now what you've done is you've essentially developed um, weeds that are stronger than they should have been. And so you get into uh, that problem. And you also get into the problem of uh, pushing out small farmers because you have to think, these thing, these GMOs are patented, all right? So you have the problem where the farmers, they hear all these great stories that, oh, GMOs, yeah, I'm gonna get rich if I just buy one. And then they buy one and it doesn't work. And they're like, okay, I might as well, I, I need to buy more. So to cope up and so they buy like 10 or, or whatever and so this keeps going and they, and they start becoming more and more dependent on these GMOs which ties into the dependency theory and stuff and so as you can see there's many supports f for the bio-revolution and I mean the yeah the bio-revolution and there's many shortcomings and it's up to you to evaluate whether or not it's worth it or not and so I've horrendously messed up on the time here. It's going to be much longer than 15 minutes. So I will see you in my next video where I continue on with subsistence agriculture. Discard.